Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? We can start. Uh, thank you very much for coming today for this extraordinary seminar. And uh, this is really great honor and pleasure for me to um, welcome and introduce our today guests. Uh, professors Aleda and Jan Asman. And uh, Aleda Asman is here and Jan Asman uh, is also here with us. And I believe that here at this university and certainly in this room there is no person uh, who wouldn't know these names. And uh, this is not only because uh, Aleida and Jan Asman are so famous and uh, influential in the field of memory studies, but I think that also because uh, there are people who made memory studies so famous and influential in modern social sciences. And uh, Professor uh, Jan Asman's book on cultural memory became the basics and classics in, um, in this field, and Aleida Asman's numerous contributions to the theory of collective memory uh, made her leading authority in this area. Uh, both Asman started their careers in Heidelberg in Germany in the field of Egyptology, which became the background for the elaboration of the cultural memory concept. And from 1972 until 2003, Professor Jan Asman was a chair of Egyptology at the University of Heidelberg. And uh, Aleda Asman received her habilitation at the University of Heidelberg and then moved to Constance, um, where she held the chair of uh, English and Comparative Literature until uh, 2014. Both were visiting professors in many universities in uh, uh, um, Europe and the uh, US, in Princeton, in Yale, in Vienna, in Paris, in Jerusalem, and many, many others. And uh, they have been both awarded a uh, numerous number of different academic prizes, but I would like to cite today a denomination of Balsam Prize for Collective Memory, which they uh, received in 2017. For, for the shared inter- and transdisciplinary elaboration of the concept of cultural memory and its defining clarifications as a paradigm in the field of cultural studies as well as in public debates. For a decades long exchange about very different historical realities and models, which in a truly extraordinary way proved to be complementary. For the work carried out independently of far-reaching impact, uh, which presents collective memory as a requirement for the formation of the identity of religious and political communities. And the uh, family of Aleda Jan Asman made incredible lifetime achievements in two voices as another board of trustees formulated their merits. And uh, they are exceptional family which has five children and uh, in fact for many of my friends and colleagues they represent an ex uh, incredible example and standard of um, work and life. Uh, but the life and the work go on. Aleda Asman, who is our main speaker today, has always promptly echoed um, the most urgent, the most pressing um, uh, issues of uh, European society. And the topic for today's discussion is reimagining the nation memory and identity and emotions. And Aleda Asman is going to debate today the problems of the nation, the concept and social reality. So and now I give floor to our guests and please welcome Professor Aleda Asman. Thank you so much, um, Professor Melnikova, for this uh, very generous and empathetic introduction. <clears throat> Um, I'm happy that you stress uh, the work, life, maybe not balance, but interaction in our <clears throat> um, trade union or whatever we created uh, around the concept of memory. It is um, really something that has kept us busy and uh, always looking not only backward but always forward because we found this topic in ever new historical circumstances. So we found after some time that once we had <clears throat> discovered it and, and uh, <clears throat> learned and studied it, we could never again let go because there were always new issues. And I will present you some of these new issues um, today and I'm very happy to, to be here and thank you for your kind invitation and taking the initiative to bring me to this wonderful European University. Now, let me see. 
my first chapter, which is the return of the nation. Within the framework of modernization theory, the nation was considered to be a transitory stage on the way to larger cosmopolitan units, uh, <clears throat> to one which is called world society. This evolution was supposed to be driven by the force of globalization that was expected to eventually dissolve national borders and replace them by strong links of interdependence in an unbounded market economy. Modernization theorists, technocrats, managers, but also leftists and cosmopolitans shared a view of history in which the concept of the nation was rendered obsolete. But also in memory studies, the nation was treated with suspicion. The term methodological nationalism was created as a deterrent from engaging with this concept. The reason is clear. Any engagement with the nation was suspected to wittingly or unwittingly promote nationalism, a term used synonymously with right-wing extremism or fascism. But I would like to ask you, but don't we all live in nations? As far as I can see, there is as yet no real alternative for the nation. Nations, of course, do not exist in a void. They exist in states that can be either liberal democracies or autocratic regimes. Today, the principles of liberal democracy are challenged in Europe and elsewhere. We are experiencing a strong pull by right-wing parties that systematically dismantle democratic structures and openly promote illiberal transformations. <laughs> Tabooing and abandoning the concept of the nation by the left may even have contributed to empower the right, who has, in the meantime, answered the trend towards pluralization with polarization. While pluralization had been backed up by social utopia, polarization is backed up by spite, resentment, or outright hatred. Political ideologies have given way to identity politics and to collective emotions as the driving force of politics. This is also a wake-up call for memory studies. For more than a decade, we emphatically opted for transnational memories. I definitely include myself in this perspective. Our normative emphasis was progressive, leftist, and cosmopolitan. In studying and recommending transnational memories, we had hoped that this would automatically strengthen them. In our liberal thinking, we have forgotten the nation, but illiberal thinkers and movements have not. Right-wing nationalists have returned. They are presenting themselves unashamedly and are emphatically steering political action in Europe, the EU today. Let me start with an example. In the mid-90s, the, mid the European Parliament decided to create a House of European History in Brussels. This project proved more difficult than expected. After 10 intensive years of brainstorming and preparations, the first team of experts gave up when they discovered that a unifying master narrative for Europe was not available. A second team was more successful. It shows a different <laughs> approach that focused mainly on the 19th and 20th century, and here in particular on the history of European unification in a global context. It was designed to present European history as a transnational process, emphasizing the plurality of experiences and, ex and perspectives. The museum opened in 2016, And it was generally praised for its multi-perspectival <clears throat> approach and its reflexive presentations. This remained the state of affairs until a group of Visegrad states undertook a collective trip to Brussels to visit the House of European History in August 19, uh, 2017. They were not, all, not at all pleased with what they saw and strongly objected to the whole concept of the museum 
because they could not find a reference to nations and nation states in this museum. What they held to be most important and in fact most sacred, namely the nation, proved to be totally absent from this museum. As they did not find themselves adequately represented, they strongly criticized the museum as a fraud and denigration of history. Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki had a simple explanation for the museum. Because of the conspicuous absence of reference to nations, he argued it, it presented a communist view. For him, the EU was the revival of the Soviet Union with the Poles once more in the position of a victim at the hands of an ideological enemy. The presentation is seen as an homage to the Homo Sovieticus, a man without nationalities in a homogeneous mass of identical nations. Such criticism obviously tells us more about prejudices and paranoia <clears throat> than about the real house of European history in Brussels. <laughs> For these visitors, the museum works like a screen on which the undigested histories of European nations are projected. It shows how a history that has not been worked through repeats itself. In the Polish view, Brussels is now the new Moscow. There may indeed be historical memories, experiences, and emotions involved here. In Germany, for instance, intellectuals dropped the concept of the nation for another obvious reason that had to do with historical memory. During its Nazi period, the country had had an overdose of nationalism that had degenerated into the murderous regime of national socialism with the worst possible consequences for Europe and its Jews. In Poland, on the other hand, the historical experience taught the opposite lesson. Due to foreign invasion and occupation, the country had completely vanished from the map in previous times, and when the Polish state was re-established after the First World War, underwent long periods of persecution, occupation, and foreign dominance during and after the Second World War. No wonder that the concept of the nation is estimated differently within the EU. While for some member states, such as Germany, it was a welcome invitation to leave the concept of the nation behind and to focus on the transnational level of Europe, for others like Poland, Europe became inversely the guarantor of the nation state and when this nation state was threatened by liberal values and immigration, Europe was turned into the enemy that endangered and once again the survival of the nation. In a country like Germany, the continued indifference of intellectuals concerning the nation had detrimental effects. One negative consequence was that the extreme right had an easy chance to pick up the empty container of the nation and to fill it with its own values, images, emotions, and promises. And it is this party, AFD party, is very uh, actually successful uh, with this mission in recuperating the nation, <clears throat> claiming it. For themselves. Another negative consequence is that a country without a clear self image and a shared sense of its own nationhood has great difficulties to integrate new migrants. They have left something behind and expect not only shelter but also a new homeland into which they are invited and introduced in order not only to share but also to shape and to transform their new nation by contributing their own experiences and competences. If the nation presents itself as an empty signifier, however, the call of the previous homeland <clears throat> will remain the normative instance and new bonds of loyalty un are unlikely to develop. A shared identity is usually expressed in terms of national pride, but pride has been sidelined in Germany as a possible option for collective identification. Are there other positive options available that can serve as a robust source of common identification 
in a democratic and diverse society? And what role can memory play here? These are questions that deserve attention and investigation, because in Europe, the battle against migrants is vocally articulated by right-wing groups that are becoming more and more self-assertive, supporting populist demands for easy solutions, strong borders, and reckless leaders. This new nationalism is ready to forego and forget lessons of history that had successfully domesticated and democratized the nations of the EU over the last 70 years. If the nation, however, is an important rescue for, uh, resource for integration, <coughs> and integration is seen as a common project for both its citizens and its migrants, how can it be reimagined and supported to live up to this difficult and important task? In the course of my lecture, I will try and look at these problems and analyze them in the light of new and older concepts. And I start with a book that has come out last year. No, I think it is last year in English, this year in German. Francis, uh, Francis Fukuyama. He had been a staunch modernization theorist who, after the, the demise of communism, had taken for granted that not only the nation, but that also history would disappear altogether. Now, 30 years after his book on the end of history and the last man, Fukuyama seems to need to revise his premises. In his recent book, Identity, Contemporary Identity Politics and the Struggle for Recognition, he registers another global transformation and addresses the current crisis of the American nation. Its foundational <clears throat> formula, e pluribus unum, which is on the coin of the, of the dollar, um, seems less and less able to contain the multiplicity of self-assertive and self-centered groups that are giving up their em <clears throat> emotional investment in a common nation and its liberal values. The social consensus is eroded by identity politics, fueled by an ongoing struggle and competition for social recognition. This is his diagnosis. Like so many others, Fukuyama blurs the important distinction between individual and collective identity and generalizes them in his overly repeated formula of identity politics. Identities, he writes, can be and uh, are incredibly varied based on nation, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or gender. They are all manifestations of a common phenomenon, that of identity politics. For Fukuyama, identity politics is driven by emotions. In this context, he introduces a new term that was absent from modernization theory so far, and that he now presents as a new key to human motivations, namely tumors. He found this term in the Greek dialogues of Plato. Tumors is a severe blow to the idea of human behavior as it was presented by modernization theory, and as it overturns turns the rational choice description of economists who had focused only on self-interest and a narrow concern for utility. <laughs> to Moss, connected to the value and valor of the warrior, <clears throat> and uh, connects um, and emphasizes male courage, enthusiasm, and patriotism, Motivations that lead men to perform outstanding heroic feats of honor for the collective. To Moss writes, Fukuyama is the seat of both anger and pride. And he continues, it is the seat of today's identity politics. From the very start, memory studies have been engaged with emotions 
But it took a long time for philosophers, economists, and political scientists to recognize the role of collectives and the emotions as a vital part of human thinking, judging, acting, and decision-making. Therefore, Fukuyama's introduction of the term tumors is interesting. But his shortcut from Plato to today's identity politics is highly problematic, I would like to add, as he uses tumors as a passepartout concept that levels all distinctions and bypasses historical contexts. In his definition, he raises the emphatically, emphatically male tumors <clears throat> to a universal principle, uh, to a universal aspect of human personality that craves recognition. Because the desire for recognition seems to lie within every human soul. Recognition thus becomes the overriding concept, including both megalotumia, which is the craving recognition for outstanding feats in the aristocratic warrior tradition, and isotumia, namely the craving, rec craving recognition in liberal democracies, where everyone is recognized as inherently equal. With the link between tumors and recognition, Fukuyama is confident that he has forged a key to unlock the problems of identity politics. I quote again, contemporary identity politics is driven by the quest for equal recognition by groups that have been marginalized by their societies. But that desire for equal recognition can easily slide over into a demand for recognition of the group's superiority. What, <clears throat> well, Fukuyama rightly criticizes in identity politics a tendency to create watertight boundaries around such groups that make it difficult to communicate, interact, and collaborate within a common social framework. Here's an example. Our son is a filmmaker who has edited a documentary about two black boxers from Chicago. <clears throat> Some white critics argued that he and the director were not entitled to engage in such a project because they did not have the right skin color, denouncing their work as cultural appropriation. They were relieved, however, when, after the film premiered at the Berlinale, these voices disappeared and their artistic work of nine years with, the, with these two boys was accepted and even praised. Acknowledging and respecting the lived experience of marginalized and victimized groups is one thing. Creating fences around them and sealing their experiences as untouchable, incomprehensible, and untranslatable for others is a problematic strategy that undermines communication, free speech, art, empathy, shared values, and joint projects. My own criticism now of Fukuyama's concept of tumors is that he conflates three historical traditions that, from my point of view, have nothing in common whatsoever. Here are the three traditions. Number one, the Greek concept, tumors, pointing to ancient Greece and an old aristocratic virile warrior spirit. Number two, the early modern concept of an autonomous inner self that goes back to the Reformation, to print culture, and to the rise of the individual in early modernity. And thirdly, the concept of human dignity that goes back to the 18th century, enlightenment, and is the cornerstone of human rights. The Greek work, word tumos, literally means anger, courage, and vigor. <clears throat> These are considered uh, to be as one of three parts of the soul according to Greek philosophy. These emotions are part of an aristocratic warrior culture and can be applied to individuals as well as to collectives, particularly nations who use emotions like honor, shame, and pride, but also anger, rage, or resentment to mobilize masses and to enforce strong group cohesion. The recognition of an inner self, however, cannot be applied to collectives at all. 
On the contrary, it empowers the individual over against societies and its institutions, such as the church or the state. In the case of the concept of human dignity, my third point is we are dealing with an ethical norm and a moral commitment to recognize a common humanity that has to be protected in all humans individually, irrespective of race, status, nationality, and any other group affiliations. The result of these conceptual slippages in Fukuyama is that he also conflates pride and dignity. <clears throat> One is an emotion, the other is an ethical principle. While pride energizes and mobilizes individuals and national collectives, recognition of human rights and dignity is written into the foundation of democratic states and has become a standard and norm to measure civilized nations. To refer to both as forms of identity po politics that equally disrupt the framework of a democratic society is therefore highly misleading. I want to pick up Fukuyama's tumors and with, <clears throat> with it emotions like pride, honor, and resentment to apply them to a critical study of national memory. In sharp contrast from dignity that is intrinsically dialogic because it depends on the recognition by others, national pride depends only on the support and participation of the members of the collective. For this reason, Peter Sloterdijk has referred to national myths as auto-hypnotic. To gain a deeper insight into the structure of national memory, it is helpful to introduce Maurice Halbwachs' concept of the social frame. Like a picture frame, a memory frame includes something and excludes everything else. National memories are ruled by a simple logic of forgetting. In Paris, for instance, you will find metro stations commemorating Napoleon's victories, such as Jena or Austerlitz, but you will not find a metro station with the name Waterloo. In order to enter this station, you have to go to London. <laughs> In other words, national memory commemorates victories and forgets defeats. The question of the frame is, what can, should, and may be articulated, and what should be bypassed or remain silent? What attracts interest and attention? What raises empathy and what remains unspoken? These questions point to the emotions as the motor and fuel of memories. While pride, craving recognition, and a positive self-image determine the selecting of memories, Emotions like guilt and shame are responsible for the exclusion and repression of memories. Nobody knew this better than Nietzsche, who wrote, I have done this, says my memory. No, I cannot have done this, says my pride and stays adamant. Finally, memory gives in. What is true for individuals is also true for groups. We remember and forget in order to belong and avoid what might have an exclusionary effect. Social frames work like filters. <clears throat> they organize the selection of memories and confirm their relevance. Whatever supports the identity of the group is remembered and the identity of the group consolidates the memories of the individuals. In other words, the relation between identity and memories is circular. These frames subsist as long as they are needed, but they can easily collapse when contexts change and new identities emerge. All of this means that in national memory, history, more often than not, is carefully reduced to a respectable narrative. When facing a traumatic and guilty past, there were only three acceptable roles for the collective. First, that of the victor that has triumphed over evil. Second, that of the resister or martyr who has fought evil. 
and thirdly, that of the passive victim who has suffered evil. What remained outside these sanctioned roles could not enter the narrative and was, on an official level, forgotten. Mark Bloch already criticized this auto-hypnotic or monological character of national memory in the 1920s. He said, let's stop talking forever from national history to national history without understanding each other. He called this conversation, I quote him again, a dialogue between, between deaths in which both give wrong answers to the questions of the other. Collective memory, collective memory simplifies, wrote Peter Novick much later. It sees everything from a single, emotionally charged perspective. It can't bear ambivalences and reduces events to archetypes. After the end of the Cold War, however, a new format of national memory emerged in the EU as an absolute historical innovation. It also emphasizes positive events, but also expands the frame to assign a place to the victims of one's own history. This dialogic memory, as I call it, was not imposed by politicians from above, but created by civil society and its demands for historical truth. When after 1989, hitherto sealed archives were suddenly accessible uh, in Eastern Europe, <clears throat> archival documents, historical research, historical commissions, and the collection of oral testimonies significantly enlarged the scope of our historical knowledge, challenging some firmly established national self-images and causing the revision of various national narratives in the EU. And here you have a couple of examples. <coughs> New documents, I just saw uh, the book of Henri Rousseau on a table uh, here around the corner. New documents about Vichy <coughs> on the one hand and the uh, lack of awareness of the history of Jews in, in the GDR. Germany, put an end to the self-image of France or GDR as pure resistor nations, pure resistor nations. After the scandals about the National Socialist past of Aust Austrian President Kurt Waldheim, for instance, and after information about <coughs> Polish pogroms in Jedwabne or Kielce, such different countries uh, like Austria or Poland were no longer able to exclusively claim the status of a victim, passive victim. And even the seemingly neutral Swiss were confronted with their own sites of memory in the shape of their banks and borders. In contact with the crime of the Holocaust, national memories became more dialogic, integrating also negative instances in their past, <clears throat> and also into their national narrative. Since the 1990s, national memories no longer exist in isolation in the EU, but they are tied together here with other national memories across their borders. The Holocaust has become part of a global memory, the Second World War part of a European memory. Richard Sennett has once remarked that it takes a plurality of contending memories in order to acknowledge uncomfortable historical facts. This explains why the constellation of the EU provided a unique frame for the transformation of monologic into dialogic memories. It is good that we exchange <laughs> memories and learn what others think of our stories. The whole European history becomes increasingly a common stock, accessible to everyone without the constraints of national prejudice or other restrictions of bias. Uh, and this is a quote from Georgi Conrad, who just passed away. He made this statement <clears throat> 11 years ago. 11 years ago, the situation since then, the situation has changed dramatically. We are experiencing a rollback of nationalism and a return of the old monologic patterns. After the opening of hitherto closed borders in the EU, we are now experiencing 
the erection of mental borders. Here's another example. A new museum of the Second World War opened in March 2017 in Gdansk and was closed again after only two weeks. It was initiated by Donald Tusk, who, <clears throat> Tusk, who accepted with enthusiasm the plan of historian Pavel Makievich, who had drafted a sketch for a truly European museum of the Second World War. Tusk installed Makievich as the founding director, who worked for eight years together with a team of illustrious internal, international experts. This museum presented the Second World War as an entangled European history in a dialogic framework. Focusing on transnational relations, introducing different perspectives, honoring the civil victims of war, and emphasizing pacifistic values. This, however, was not at all to the taste of Jaroslav Kaczynski's peace party. His plan is now to replace the museum as soon as possible by another museum of the so-called Westerplatte, the place where eight heroes resisted German aggression at the outbreak of the war. <clears throat> the outbreak <clears throat> was on September 1st in this month, 80 years ago. The plan of this museum is the very opposite. It allows only one perspective, it supports the national narrative, it presents only heroes and martyrs, and it celebrates the cult of war. We are back under the rule of Timos and age-old principles of monologic national memory, with the state constructing its history as dictated by the emotions of pride and honor. <clears throat> to repeat Peter Novik, in Poland or Hungary, national memories can't bear ambivalences and reduce events to archetypes. Pride rules again, but in the third and fourth post-Holocaust generations, the emphasis is no longer on guilt and shame, but on responsibility and empathy. Those who prolong the language of guilt and shame are hysterically protecting the honor of the nation against better knowledge and conscience. Access to historical truth and education, however, are basic rights in a democratic state, and educated citizens do not weaken the nation, but strengthen it. In the last part of my presentation, I want to introduce you to an as yet unacknowledged pioneer of memory studies. After Fukuyama and Halbwachs, he is my third theoretical reference in this lecture. And I I guess you have never heard his name, so let me briefly introduce him. <clears throat> I am uh, I'm speaking of George Mossy, an immigrant from Berlin and professor of history in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, he was born 1918 and died in 1999. In his book, Fallen Soldiers, <clears throat> Reshaping the Memory of the World Wars from 1990, <laughs> The word memory appears already prominently in the title, although at the time it had neither been an analytic tool nor an established term of reference yet. Mosse, as I want to show, was not only a famous scholar of nation building and nationalism, but also an important memory scholar avant la lettre. His Jewish and gay focus turned him into an innovative cultural historian with a great sensibility for the gendered body, implicit norms of respectability, and national rights and symbols. Instead of writing another history of the Great War, Mosse focused on the memory making of this war and how it was continued into the post-war period. Although the ceasefire on the 11th of, 11 of November 1918 was a huge relief, the war, he argued, was not so easily terminated. Mechanical warfare, the daily encounter with mass death and the loss of 13 million soldiers, all this had a tremendous impact on the hearts and minds of the people and demanded new responses. A huge gap had opened up between the horror and the glory of the war. 
And it was a great challenge for all the nations involved to fill that gap by creating symbols that mask and transcend death in war. In this situation, all nations <clears throat> adopted the memory of those veterans <clears throat> as true and legitimate who saw the war as containing positive elements and not those who rejected the war. As the emphasis was on consolation and justification and not on the general tragedy of the war, the nations constructed a myth which would draw the sting from death in war and emphasize the meaningfulness and the fighting of the fighting and the sacrifice. The result of this memory making was what Mosse termed the myth of the war experience. I call it the MWE. It displayed the reality of war experience and refashioned it as a sacred experience involving new saints and martyrs, places of worship, and a heritage to emulate. This sacralization of war went hand in hand with the sacralization of the nation. Mosse did not use the term myth to expose or explode it <clears throat> as a lie. Deconstruction of the myth was later the job of Erich Maria Remarks, all, quest, um, all, quiet, all quiet on the Western Front, and the post-war generation and international anti-war movement. Mosse, on the contrary, was interested in the circumstances and, and ways in which it was constructed and how it shaped human behavior and the self-image of nations. He wrote, It was the accounts of the volunteers which were most apt to become part of the national canon and concedes that this was only a small minority, but as other volunteers remained silent, it was the minority's poetry and prose which attracted attention. The European nations developed different versions of the myth, while the Victorian nations, France and Britain, transformed it in the dominant em emotion of mourning, in German politics, the myth was saturated with resentment and eventually became the medium to prolong the Great War into peacetime and into the next war. Here, the memory of the Great War was kidnapped by the NS state, who raised its version of this myth of the war experience into its central ideology. Nationalism became <clears throat> national socialism, and here I quote the words of Mossi, a manly faith steeled in war. A manly faith steeled in war. This furthered a new brutalization that invaded public life in the 1920s. Already, the nascent democratic spirit in Germany was up against a radical mode of constant political mobilization. The emphasis on heroic action, the normative ideal of male manliness, and the vocabulary of friend against foe, dominated more and more, leaving little space for the normalization of post-war life and the civil spirit. The vocabulary of political battle, the desire to utterly destroy the political enemy, and the way in which these adversaries were pictured all seem to continue the First World War mostly against a set of different internal war, uh, foes. Without ever mentioning Carl Schmitt, Mosse aptly characterized his political style in the political climate and context from which it emerged. For Mosse, it was the business of the historian to analyze how ideas are constructed to serve the purposes of a society and to show how these constructs gain influence, hold sway over collectives and individuals, and become tools for making politics and history. His use of the term myth was not that of Roland Barthes, but much closer to that of anthropologist Polislav Malinowski, who used the term for the stories we live by, <coughs> stories that interpret and express our values and explain where <coughs> we come from, who we are, or who we want to be. There is something wrong with the myth. There is nothing with, uh, wrong with the myth as such, but certainly with the way in which the myth of the war experience was turned into the state ideology of the militant Third Reich. 
<coughs> At first, this myth of the war experience may sound rather far away from our contemporary problems. But it is not history, as I want to argue, it is still memory. There is still emotional pressure in the unresolved issues that are part and parcel of the dynamics of forgetting and remembering, and thus a seminal part of an ongoing battle over the emotions and values in Europe. The NWE is key to a better understanding of how wars are ended or not ended. Mosse warned us, <clears throat> I quote him, there are no full stops in history when suddenly everything changes. There are long continuities in history. <clears throat> With this wary and critical stance, he alerted us <clears throat> to one of the most important questions that historians can ask, namely, how are wars ended? And we may, uh, may add, and what is the role of remembering and forgetting? <clears throat> that plays, <clears throat> what role can remembering and forgetting play in this pro process? In Europe, the myth of the war experience was effectively ended after 1945 by forgetting it. Already in 1946, Winston Churchill made this very clear in a speech on the future of Europe, addressing young students at the University of Zurich, when he said, we must all turn our backs upon the horrors, horrors of the past and look to the future. We cannot afford to drag forward across the years to come hatreds and revenges which have sprung from the injuries of the past. If Europe is to be saved from infinite misery and indeed from final doom, there must be an act of faith in the European family and an act of oblivion against all the crimes and follies of the past. This strategy of forgetting draws a finishing line under the past and lets bygones be bygone. In Europe, it laid the ground for a new transnational cooperation, especially economic cooperation, that was gladly accepted by the Germans. Such a policy of forgetting has worked for many times in history after civil wars, when two parties were fighting in a more or less symmetrical power relation. When warfare, however, is accompanied by atrocities perpetrated against civilians and defenseless minorities, when, in other words, words uh, wars become genocidal, the policy of forgetting has a serious drawback because it supports the perpetrators and it harms the victims. The forgetting policy worked in Germany after 1945 for four decades, <clears throat> promoting economic growth, empowering the transnational union of a new Europe, but it did not bring the war to an end. The policy of forgetting ended itself in the 1980s and 90s. Due to a generational change and the fall of the wall, a new era started that saw an overwhelming return of repressed and excluded memories that had been held at bay by the social, cultural, and political frames constructed in the period of the Cold War. I know what I'm talking about because I grew up in this period. There were many ways in which the silenced past suddenly returned to European nations, cities, families in the 1980s and 90s. The Second World War was thus brought to an end twice, first after 1944, <clears throat> with a conscious collective act of forgetting, and then 50 years later with a collective will to remember. <clears throat> what about the commemoration of the First World War? It returned after 100 years, not as a repressed memory, but in the conscious format of a centenary commemoration. Public anniversaries mark particular dates and offer the chance to bring an historic event back into the present, not necessarily only for the mere continuation of the memory, but also for its reinspection and its reinterpretation. This happened on a large scale in the commemoration period 2014 to 18 which brought the first Great War back to European nations, an event that had been commemorated annually in some countries, while in others it had dropped completely from memory, school curricula, and public consciousness. 
While on every November the 11th, the day of the truth, the French, the Belgians, the British mourn and commemorate their war dead, the Germans start their carnival season. President François, an example for uh, forgetting. President François Hollande's contribution to the commemoration years on this day in 2014 was an impressive gift called the Ring of Memory. <clears throat> in the north of France, near Arras. It is an outstanding monument, not only in terms of its scale, but also in its design. The 500 brass plates of the huge cyclical structure list more than half a million fallen soldiers in the region, irrespective, and this is the point, of their origin, their regiments, or nations. It is a truly European monument in so far, and here I would like to emphasize that this is an absolute huge shift in the use and meaning of, more, of the genre of war monuments, in so far as it is dedicated to all the dead and the shared memory and mourning of the mutual slaughter. This monument abstains from the former rhetoric former rhetoric of honor and glory, and clearly brings the war to an end. We may perhaps even call it a monument to the death of the myth of the war experience. But while President Hollande opted, for a narrow, <clears throat> opted out of the narrow national tradition of commemoration, David Cameron at the same time did the very opposite. When he presented his plans for the commemoration year in the Imperial War Museum in 2012, you opted out of the European commemorative network and strongly reinforced the British version of the myth of the war experience. In his truly national commemoration, <clears throat> he included the tr colonial troops of the glorious former empire. Cameron praised repeatedly the service, service and the sacrifice of the fallen soldiers and promised the project <clears throat> to project their memory into the future for another 100 years. Lest we forget, this British exceptionalism is also clearly visible in the continuing annual rites of November 11 in the United Kingdom, a national commemoration day that is celebrated with growing ardor, judging from the size of its central symbol, the red poppy. What fell flat in Cameron's commemoration plans was a reference to the partners of the EU. This emphatic affirmation of national sovereignty was already a clear signal for British isolationism four years before the Brexit. While the national myth of the war experience was laid to rest in France to make place for a shared and more dialogic <laughs> European memory, it continues fervently in the UK, where such a shared memory is not yet in sight. Let me, at the end of my lecture, in passing, point to other instances where the Second World War has not yet been ended in the hearts and minds of the people, but continues to exert pressure on the EU. In Italy, for instance, April 25th was a national anniversary day commemorating the end of the Second World War. On this day in 45, the Allies liberated Italy by putting an end to the fascist regime. This day, year, however, the defeat of the fascist forces was no longer a day to remember for Premier, uh, then Premier Matteo Salvini from the right wing Lega. Ostentatiously disrespecting the commemoration date, Salvini complied with a new or rather old trend in Italy that has rehabilitated Mussolini as a national hero and put him back on his pedestal in public space. Co-Vice Premier <clears throat> Luigi Di Maio, then of the Five Stars Movement, objected to Salvini's provocation and confirmed that he stands behind those who liberated Italy, the resistors and the Partisans. This dissent among the leaders of the state is a visible sign that the Second World War has not ended in this country. The eruptions of dissent and protest show that a shared dialogic narrative that acknowledges and accommodates the perspectives of both sides in a national frame is still missing.
There are other instances in the EU today where a war has not yet been mentally ended. Spain is an obvious example where the unity of the nation is under double stress of political polarization and regional partition. <coughs> These issues have their origin in 20th century history, reaching back to the Civil War. The Pact of Silence in 1977 has been a pragmatic decision that enabled a successful and sustainable transition to democracy. But today there are also symptoms that this policy of forgetting is not a permanent solution <clears throat> and that this war is far from having been ended. The exhumation movement, which started after 2000, was an obvious signal. Franco's massive monument in the Valley of the Fallen had been an attempt to end the war symbolically by sealing it with his stamp, Franco's stamp, but in doing so, he has not laid the memory to, uh, of the past to rest at all. Instead, <coughs> after 80 years, he left future generations a huge scar and his historical wound. And by the way, yesterday we learned that Franco's remains are going to be extracted from this monument. It is, uh, if you are not familiar with it, it's now a mixture. He um, amalgamated, in a way, the <clears throat> uh, bones of uh, the resistors or the <clears throat> republicans and the fascists uh, in one big monument and was put to rest uh, in this very, <clears throat> this very monument. And he sealed the whole history in doing so. And now it is opened again. And the idea is, uh, is to remove Franco from this site. And uh, the uh, fantastic argument is he does not belong into the Valley of the Fallen because he is not, he was not fall, uh, fallen. So um, this uh, story again <coughs> uh, continues after 80 years. It is obviously difficult to hold the nation together without some kind of consensus about seminal events in its history. Imagine, for instance, a Germany, I imagine this for me, myself, in which half of the population believes that erecting a wall in Berlin and Europe was a good thing. I come to my conclusion. <clears throat> Brutalizing or civilizing the nation. In the 1980s, Mosse registered that the MWE as a whole seems to have passed into European history. But he also added, the future is open. If nationalism as a civic religion is once more in the ascendant, the myth will once again accompany it. For Mosse, <clears throat> War itself was the great brutalizer. <clears throat> so it followed for him that some of what has been called the civilizing process was undone under such pressure. Brutalizing and civilizing are opposite tracks along which nations may aspire. We must not forget that many Europeans saw the First World War as a recipe for regeneration through violence. That was denounced as a, <clears throat> what was denounced as a degenerate and effeminate culture had to be replaced by a strong ideal of heroic manliness. In civil times, these fits of megalotumia quickly lose their grip and are banished from the scene. But for how long? When Norbert Elias wrote about this topic, he spoke of a process of civilization. Civilization, however, is not a process, it is a project. And only humans themselves can drive this process according to their cultural values, programs, and continuous education. Nations are never brutal or civil per se, but only in relation to their cultural frames and programs. Do they opt for Timotic pride or anti-Timotic self-civilizing dignity? Do they declare the nation, the collective, the state, or the institution to be sacred? Or do they place that sacredness in the individual? Reimagination of the nation is a pressing problem and a huge task. And as I hope to show, it is certainly worthy of all of our attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your interesting lecture. Uh, we have enough time for, for questions, if you don't mind.
Okay, uh, questions are welcome. Maybe some ideas, comments, and remarks. <laughs> Silence, as I told you uh, yesterday and today, we discussed your texts, and uh, just yesterday uh, we discussed also the book which quotes Law's text and most, most extensively the book of uh, Gerard uh, and Manuel and the book of uh, Horn and Gerard about violence in uh, post First World period. They actually criticize uh, this book the idea of Mosse that verbalization of uh, war was the main source of violence in this culture. Their thesis is it's not just about male violence, and uh, in a sense, this brutalization was partially the product of post-war situation <coughs> of ethnic conflicts and civil wars. And uh, this brings me to your conclusion so, in principle, I, I agree with you. So, we must oppose a kind of some civilizing or try, uh, try to push uh, the situation in, in this direction. But reality is, is uh, complicated, uh, I mean. Uh, so, of course, there are uh, good fields for civilizing process like within Europe. However, you, as you told, even in Europe there are uh, Problems. But the world is cruel right now. So we have 30, 40 civil wars right now in different parts of the world. And I'm afraid the number of civil wars is increasing and is to be increased. The reality is like this. So what, how, how to realize this project in a situation like this? Okay. Thank you for your question. I would like to challenge uh, the term reality is like this. Uh, you are a historian and you are analyzing reality, past reality, and, um, and this is what is usually you know, really the important task of the historian. George Mossi is a historian of a, I would call it a second order. He does not only, well, he leaves it to the other historians to reconstruct the facts, um, but he does something else which until then, historians had never done, and which I found absolutely innovative and uh, groundbreaking. He also analyzes <clears throat> what is in the minds of the people. It's a kind of history of mentality, of habitus. What is how how things are <clears throat> they're sort of like into the body. You know how body images, self images work. All of this is also certainly part of reality. We cannot separate this from reality. We don't have a need objectivist, clean notion of reality here, and then uh, we have this messy stuff of uh, mental um, <clears throat> habits. No, no, this is how reality is created and is produced, and I think it is exactly uh, this um, uh, contact and entanglement of the reality <laughs> with mental history, which is so um, uh, promising and important, because for me, it really, um, uh, it's, it's like turning on a light and suddenly I understand longer, long term continuations and uh, uh, problems uh, that are never really the issue or the objective of historians who are always um, necessarily, and of course I understand and accept this um, in a field, this, uh, in a discipline, they have very clear, clear, clear uh, borders within which they work and methodological borders also. Which is all fine, but uh, I would like to introduce because it is um, uh, we, we need a larger picture. We need uh, other aspects that have been uh, excluded so far, and there I see an option to think more about <coughs> mental um, figures, which are not, uh, ideology is already a term that is too uh, strict uh, or too dense, uh, and I think this mental history is is. Um, more effective because it goes deeper in the hearts and minds of the people and it is what catches them and, <laughs> and it is, uh, the consequences of their action is, is really uh, implanted into them in a way by this collective uh, <clears throat> formation or shaping, shaping of, of minds and uh, 
and people. And therefore, I think it's a dimension which we, which we need to add. And in this context, I think also we, uh, from the point of view of memory studies, we can easily connect um, to these ideas because uh, memory studies is very much um, dependent on uh, frames of acceptance or non-acceptance and um, changes in the possibilities to include more into the frame or less uh, are always connected um, with changes of sense sensibility. So it goes very deep and uh, is not so, does not lie on, on the surface so easily that we can pick it up. Uh, with a, a, a connected and a tell, a, tell a story about it. Um, but uh, rather, my interest is in creating, recreating the frameworks within which reality happened, within which history evolved. Uh, this, is, uh, this is, I think, the addition uh, that um, why Mosse is helpful, uh, creating the frameworks within the, which this history not only evolved, but is still impacting on us. Yeah, it has consequences. There's, there are things that are not ended. This is why I use the question of how are our wars ended. Uh, now you mentioned that there are so many other wars. Now this is, sounds like a statistical idea. First of all, I, of course, I cannot respond to this. You, you must be right. But uh, in these uh, individual cases, the question is, of course, also where do they come from? We have to learn more about um, the ideology, the, the emergence or the continuation of, of repressed problems that do not cease. And so I think one of the biggest issues that we are confronting is to bring wars to an end. And uh, to look also at, at the ways in which there is still explosive energy um, pressing from uh, unended uh, wars. And one of these examples was the situation that's within Europe where it is becoming really obvious. Thank you very much. Any more questions with ideas? Uh, well, you have. Oh, okay, please. Thank you so much for your presentation. I would like uh, to know much about your personal trajectory. How did you come to uh, this problem of memory from your initial field of research of English literature? Okay. Uh, that is very interesting for me as a historian of German and yeah. Russian source. Yeah. Very okay, story. yeah, we switch so and go to biography and yeah, you can be young. Um, because we spoke of our own home spun um, focus um, on memory here. I, there were actually three. I, I, I can tell you now, usually you don't know why you do things, and you're just sort of compelled to go on and do this and that without ever thinking about the trajectory that within which you are. Uh, but I just had the necessity to think about it, so now I know it. <laughs> and I can tell you that there were three main uh, impulses that led us into this direction. One impulse was, and you may be surprised that we go so far away, it was Africa. Um, and I give you a sentence which uh, startled us in, um, uh, in the late 70s, and the sentence is um, by a <clears throat> A person from Mali, a philosopher, and he said, with every uh, ancient person uh, who dies in Africa, a whole library burns, is burned. Uh, this sentence was amazingly important. He said it in a speech before the uh, UNESCO. It was the moment when there was an awareness that modernization progress and all of that um, promoted not only to the extinction of uh, natural resources, but also cultural resources, and that uh, cultures that had no written legacy were doomed to go extinct. And he said, this is why he said that with every other person who dies, the whole library uh, is, is burned. And we became very interested in the question, how is cultural memory um, transmitted? What are the institutions? And what are then also the <clears throat> Um, imbalances in terms of power, you know, because if you have written archives and all of that, you can refer to something in the UNESCO and museums and, and libraries and all of that. And if you don't have that, what you, what you have to show is terribly fragile and precarious. And um, 
in this uh, context, we became aware uh, of asking the question, cultures are not, not anything that can be taken for granted in literate as well as in um, oral societies. Uh, you need institutions of, of learning and transmitting and uh, just the, the archives are not everything. You have to re <clears throat> uh, bring them back to the people, back into the minds of the people, which is a real task of the literate societies to make them into, um, incarnate them as I call them, or embody them again. So that was one, one source. The second source was um, uh, digitalization. So we, we worked in the 80s. We were uh, writing our, my, I wrote my um, doctoral thesis on a typewriter, and I would argue I wrote my uh, habilitation thesis already on a computer. So uh, I myself uh, underwent this uh, epochal change of media, uh, which again created a new, deeper reflection on what it means to write, to transmit, and to store, because storage capacity of course, not yet in the 80s, but uh, it was already uh, <clears throat> uh, to be anticipated that storage capacity would increase forever. But what does that mean for memory and, and the human mind? And that was the second uh, stimulus. And the third was the returning, what I refer to in my paper, the return of memories after 40 years of collective silence in Germany. Sadly, the memories um, were all back, especially the traumatic memories. Once the period had expired, the period of silence that had dominated the social frame, and the social frame was changed. So for me, it was an extremely revolutionary event. It doesn't uh, come up as a revolution in history books, but it is a revolution of the mind that a cultural frame can be changed, and things that were left outside suddenly um, take place, um, take hold, enter, enter it. So we were actually watching this. We were, at the time, Zeitzeugen, um, uh, um, you must know the term, uh, we were Zeitzeugen as uh, witnesses, witnesses of these historical changes. So this, uh, these are three um, uh, examples of three deep impulses that led us to think about uh, these topics and therefore we always were always interested in memory on a very wide and large scale. Young coming from Egyptology and I uh, coming from um, English literature or modern cultural history and, and so forth, uh, connecting our fields in a wider way. Any more questions? Oh, okay, yeah. Very interesting. I have actually two questions about the future, especially of the past. So, first, uh, you know, we just recently learned to think about nation as a construct. And you say that nation is back, that nation is returning, and uh, all of the nationalism in the contemporary world, and in Europe at least, uh, is on the rise. So, my first question would be about the future of the nation as a concept, or I don't know, if as an essence. And my second question, if, if, if you, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and the second question is about the future of memory studies. You were very among those who found it actually as a whole field. And do you think that memory studies will evolve as a separate field, or will it join history and you know reshape history, historical studies, or will what, what will be? Uh, your view of the two fantastic questions. Thank you very much. I can I can really make a very important point for me answering the first question. You said the nation is a construct. What you imply by this sentence is the nation is an artificial construct, right? This is what you are actually telling me. And the opposite of artificial would be essence. Of course, we all know if anybody says essence, nation, or we would get very bad degree. You know, it's totally tabooed in the, in the academy. You're not allowed to say anything is an essence anymore. Everything is a construct. We are all agreed. We do not have to go around chasing people like, you are still thinking about essences, you are on the wrong track. This is a really a game, seek and hide game, which I really detest in the academy. We are all agreed on, on certain things, but we always need to reconstruct false opinions in order to fight them. I don't need anybody to present this false opinion because I'm no longer interested in the false opinion, at least about being attributed to me. 
I will tell you exactly the difference here. Of course it is a construct. It is not an artificial construct. It is a social construct. It is part of history and reality. This is what I have tried to tell your colleague next to me. It is a social construct, and therefore it is part of reality. George Mosse is one of those who shows us, don't describe it, don't, if we say it was a lie. Wonderful, we know exactly what is right, we have the superior perspective on everything, we know we are right, but we have not explained anything. By saying I'm more interested than in just deconstructing everything, I'm more interested in how is it constructed. Of course, socially, politically, culturally, in all these dimensions, he is the first, actually, historian to write not about living soldiers and generals and armies, but on dead soldiers. What a new, amazingly innovative idea to write about how dead soldiers are used by the living, you know, to further their aims. So this is a social and political construct, and that makes history. Uh, that was the first uh, um, point. And the second is memory studies. It's really interesting to see that memory studies is still not um, generally proved of. It doesn't have the okay yet. We have won prizes and we had hoped it would make it more respectable as a field to engage in, but it's not happening. We are still, I'm, I'm still very aware that uh, memory studies is um, under the suspicion and distrust of historians. They, they have a kind of, uh, it's, it's like the oral witness who is a natural enemy of the historian because he of course has better sources and better knowledge. Memorialists even are worse because they are subversive. They, they uh, turn the sources around and do all kinds of fuzzy stuff that is, is threatening. And I'm not uh, really Im imputing it all to you, but I know I had this constant struggle uh, with historians. What I always try to say in this case is the following. Memory studies cannot do anything without historians. It is the worst thing to oppose, like artificial essence. These are constructs of opposition binaries that do not lead us anywhere. And uh, the opposition, memory versus history, does not lead us anywhere. We fought it for at least a decade or two decades, but I think it is now over, it should be over. And we should all know that there are aspects um, in historical research that are not grasped within this field that can be dealt with in memory studies, and there are many, many aspects in memory studies that cannot be dealt with in memory uh, need historical research. Therefore, I think it is an artificial divide. Um, we need a strong um, collaboration between these two um, divides. The problem is really the academy. Um, academic structures are extremely uh, um, um, tenacious. It's very difficult to change them. Uh, the praxis changes very quickly. We had the fifth, fourth mnemonic uh, conference in Madrid, and there were 5,000 people already coming, and historical conventions of teachers and students draw less and less uh, people. Now, you can see there's a kind of uh, voting with their fee coming from all over the world and, and doing this uh, stuff, but we don't see it reflected in the structures of the universities. If you want to do a degree, you have to do it exactly in this particular field, and other, um, if you don't continue it path dependent, you will not get a job. Yeah, it's, it's a critical situation. Will there be a, a change or will these fields become more inclusive and allow uh, a change of perspective uh, or, or balance uh, within their fields uh, or will they try to keep this, this outside? We have not yet, uh, it's still emerging and it, it, it's not yet uh, in, a, in a clear uh, stage, the future where it, where it will go. What is clear, however, is that it is taken hold maybe not in the historical disciplines, but it is taking hold already in the schools. Um, I know that um, some of these ideas uh, work very well on the, on the level of uh, school education. Um, school students go out and start to research their own you know, local uh, districts. They, they have new um, interest to uh, know about the past of where they live and to uh, also <clears throat> go to the archives and reconstruct the city's history or, or whatever uh, issues um, are relevant for them. So you can do it from any perspective that you want, and it is even easy, an easy tool that can be conveyed uh, within schools. So from that point of view, 
uh, it, it is becoming more important and also on the level of people who try to transmit or mediate historical content into uh, the, their own uh, sense of the present. And people want to know about history not just by reading a, a book with a closed sort of frame chapter, but also with the uh, long-term effects on that particular place. So as people within their biographies become more interested in history, they, could, they also tend to uh, uh, adopt this um, more and more. But in terms of um, academic institutions, it's still uh, an open question. I <laughs> know there are too many questions. Uh, so far, okay, let's start from the beginning. Sorry, yeah, Sandra. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to ask about the economic side of memory today. Because, for example, the most uh, debated uh, project uh, in Russia is Yeltsin Center in uh, Yekaterinburg. It's a very debated uh, place and it's a place of memory of 1990s in Russia. But for other countries, it, it's built in building which has offices <coughs> and uh, uh, shops. And it's all is in the center. It's a key project of redevelopment of city center. And the same case is with Gdańsk, which you showed. Uh, all these museums in Gdańsk are in this Redevelop part of redevelopment. So, how do you see the role of a current economic uh, course of European Union, other countries, uh, uh, and uh, memory? Mm -hmm. Well, um, my um, colleague and friend Jay Winter uh, always emphasized the close connection between economics and, and memory studies or mem memory making. Um, it, um, it is. It, you have costs if you want to establish monuments, and you need spaces, and you have to discuss it with the city council and so forth. Um, uh, but um, it is also an, an economic uh, factor more and more from the point of view that um, selling heritage, to put it very crudely, uh, has become uh, really um, uh, something that, that's, uh, that uh, is um, done more and more and tourism and so forth, and then um, cultural heritage, UNESCO and so forth, and raising the prestige of the city with another museum. Um, many, many people <coughs> uh, really go to museums and are interested. There's a, there's a strong movement, uh, socially speaking, um, but it started already in the 90s to uh, be more and more interested in uh, local also uh, history and museums, uh, there, there's a trend, so it, it is certainly part of, of the city's economy, but it is also part of the city's self-understanding. So the self-image of the city is, is changing, and uh, with a new uh, museum or with a new emphasis on, on the past. Um, from that point of view, it is something that is, uh, interestingly enough, the, the German word, museal, you, um, it has a very dusty kind of association. Whatever is museal, museum-like, uh, has collected layers and layers of dust. Uh, that's, that's one of the sense of museal. But it's, it's not what museums are today. They're, they're really part and parcel of that um, um, <clears throat> general collective self-reflection of transformation and interest um, in, in cities. And in cities, of course, it's interesting because you don't have a, such a strong national framework of the state uh, really um, <coughs> dictating what is to be uh, remembered, what is not to be remembered. Cities maybe have a, a wider or more um, multiple uh, possibility to approach. Uh, May, um, thank you for the very interesting lecture indeed. Um, comment and my question that grows out of it is as follows. Uh, whenever we raise over the individual impressions, individual memories, and they go into the, into the sphere of collective memories, ideologies, and so forth, we are entering much the same field as is uh, the field of folklore studies. And there are many shared mechanisms that I use both in, in, in the folklore studies and the folk narratives and the cultural mem memories and collective memories as they are now here. Uh, my question is, 
Uh, you mentioned Poland, and you mentioned you, you mentioned the uh, uh, the change in the attitudes, and they do in fact represent the popular myth and the popular well folk ideas of what war is. And if you look at this country, uh, all these myths and public folklore about the war is very much around. Uh, so my question is, what is the role of uh, the memory studies specialist? So is it, is it just sort of a public educator, a kulku trigger, uh, our player who, who brings the right uh, interpretation of memories? Or is it just sort of a field worker who records what, what the things are, how they, how they evolve? Uh, both conditions are equally justifiable or vulnerable. But still, I'm more interested in, in what you uh, would like to present yourself in this film. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. A wonderful question and also very um, succinctly put. Um, now, <clears throat> that's, that's very important. What, what are we doing while we're doing this? Um, first of all, I consider myself to be an observer, first of all. Um, observer noting change. Uh, for instance, uh, when I learn, learn that Franco's bones are going to be moved, for me this is a, a huge event because I know how long people have been waiting for it. <coughs> so it has a lot of resonance for me, and for others they don't think bones, what, what about bones? So, um, uh, so I have a special focus, and uh, the focus is informed by, by lots of readings and, and so a sense of uh, problems and also uh, uh, theories and all of that, um, but that does not distinguish me from any other field worker. From that point of view, I'm, I'm a field worker, but I would also um, add I'm more than a field worker, I'm also a participant uh, in, a, in a society. I am certainly also always in the picture which I'm um, describing and therefore I have a kind of double role because I always, always include my own participate, participant. Story, uh, view and also my own comments, comments and values quite outspokenly. So from that point of view, uh, as an academician um, from in the academy, of course, you're not supposed to do this. So it's a, a little uh, complicated or rather complex situation um, to be an advocate and a uh, field worker. Um, but um, most of all, I would argue um, that the, the third role is perhaps the most important to be a critical critically observe and not just collecting everything or opting for this or that, but also observing changes and warning about uh, uh, obvious uh, problems. And, and this is why we, why I use phrases like civilizing, brutalizing, they are heavily uh, charged ethically, of course, already. But I think sometimes these are uh, helped focus really many, many um, developments in one particular you know, picture and help to understand uh, in which direction this or that is going. So I think these are three positions that I all uh, share. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to A little louder, please stand up and then shout, and then I will hear you. <laughs> I'd like to know your opinion on the policy of memory of the European Union for the Second World War. Is it efficient or, and uh, has it any chance to create a transnational common European memory of this period? Uh, what uh, projects, uh, what measures are the most successful in this period? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get the very beginning of your question. Could you just repeat the beginning? Uh, so, what's your opinion on the policy of memory of the European Union yes. institution on the Second World War? Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I made that very explicit in a book which I just uh, published um, under the title The European Dream, um, which a uh, title which I used from a parallel uh, coinage of the American Dream. Compare the American dream and the European dream, which is very different because American dream does not involve history at all. And I would argue European dream has to do with learning lessons from history. This is the key concept, learning lessons. And not just in general, and of course there's a lot of debate about do people never learn from history and so forth, I'm aware of all of that. 
I'm also not interested in whether we learned or not. I want to know which lessons have we learned and whether we should abide with them or not. You know, this is uh, the point of my book. And in this book, I uh, address exactly your question. Um, what is the specific specificity of the memory policy of the European Union? And, um, and I um, describe it, and um, I think I gave you uh, really the gist of it in my lecture in the short form when I talked about frames and how to enlarge frames, how they come usually with nations. They're always built on pride and, and um, <coughs> honor, and they are very, very um, monologic and they're very auto-hypnotic. And uh, the great possibility of the EU, and this is a unique uh, case in history, you never have this, that the nations um, come together um, to share their values and projects, uh, really a, the project of a liberal democratic nation, that, that's a new. And in order to promote that kind of a type of nation that is domesticating <laughs> its you know, drive towards uh, barbarization, all these no, uh, nations have their histories of barbarization, mind you. When most of the European nations have undergone uh, dictatorships, and in Germany we had um, fascism and uh, communism as an example. So they know exactly uh, <clears throat> what it, all of this is about to domesticate and to uh, <clears throat> become more plural. And I talk about the possibility to reformat. Um, um, national memories uh, in this particular union by creating links to neighboring nations, by integrating, especially for Germany, it's, it's France and it is Poland, uh, two nations that have suffered uh, tremendously from um, German National Socialism during the Second World War, of course, others uh, as well, and we are here now uh, to talk about <clears throat> also Germany and Russia, yesterday we were at the um, a cemetery of, uh, of German soldiers south of uh, this city in Solo Bovka, Solo Bovka, and um, so we are inter I'm interested in uh, transnational. I'm coming back to the transnational um, memories, by which I mean uh, the nations uh, maintain their memories, but they open up to the memory of the other and sharing this listening to this memory. You know, this is what we did um, yesterday and the day before at, uh, at another conference. And I think that is a path that is a uh, genuine uh, innovation within uh, the EU. I'm not arguing, arguing that it uh, works easily. It's certainly difficult and, uh, to, to achieve, but um, there are obvious steps that it has already had some success. Uh, but it is now uh, also under stress because within all these EU nations we have the counter uh, movement to <laughs> rescue the nation again as this strong and monologic and prideful um, entity that we have known um, in history and uh, would not like to repeat it in Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, in the model that you just described, the reintegration um, when, when you gave your talk, you talked about the importance of, it seems to me, reimagining the nation in the present day, given that in Europe, at least, and I think the same thing is, is, is true in America, in a, in a very different, under very different circumstances, or in the United States, under very different circumstances, that the construct, which of course is very real, um, has uh, been sort of mm, hijacked, to use maybe too strong, a too strong a term. And I'm wondering to what extent into the model you incorporate um, class, of course, which I use very loosely, um, also, of course, um, as a construct that has serious legs. Um, class within, the di within, different, di within different European nations, but then also it seems to me, and this is based on a kind of pop understanding um, of, of European history, it seems to me that a real different conjuncture today is um, the ethnic makeup of many national states that in the, in the post-war period, because of population movements, became quite unitary. And so it's not, very, it's not that surprising in the context of the migrant, migrant crisis 
um, to talk about the, the European case, that it's very difficult to imagine something transnational when the national has been slowly, and especially with this kind of spike over the last um, uh, many four or five years, um, uh, has, uh, in, in the German case, is it, is mm -hmm. the case has been, the, the population has, has changed. And so how do, how do these, the, the issue of class, in short, and the issue of, uh, and the issue of, um, so population, population changes, migration. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very, very important questions here. And first of all, let me make the point quite clear. I'm not thinking of abolishing nations in order to begin, become transnational, which was the starting point, but to uh, reimagine the nation so it can interact with other nations. That, uh, as an entity, it, 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 we need it as an entity to, to, to interact. Um, and as an entity, of course, uh, you point um, very rightly to, to issues of um, segregation or distinctions or, or separations within the society, which are becoming more and more important right now. Um, class, I'm not quite sure whether we can call it class. I, I, I'm an English uh, literature professor, of course, every English literature text is saturated with class issues. To that extent, um, and maybe everyone in, in the United States with race, race issues. Um, to that extent, we cannot import these terms so easily, but there is certainly a new divide within the society, and uh, we, we, we see new blocks forming uh, right now under our eyes, and in, in Germany it has to do with the um, partition between West and East. Um, uh, and it is interesting to which extent this uh, historical, after 30 years, historical uh, separation uh, is now being uh, also raised and used to create divides that perhaps are not that deep at all, because they are hijacked by politicians. You know. And even Björn Höcke, one of the number one ideologists of the uh, far right, <laughs> he comes from West Germany and he sees this as a manco. He should come from Thüringen or, or Dresden or he would prefer that, because then he would be the real, you know, uh, right-wing uh, apostle that he uh, was to become, or is already. So um, it, we have to again look at the way in which uh, these myths or stories or narratives are being uh, generated right now in order to serve these political purposes. Because for instance, I learned that in terms of, uh, uh, there is certainly an um, economic uh, but the fella imbalance uh, uh, present between still in the production between East and West. But for instance, Alters Armut, the poverty of old people is higher in West Germany than in East Germany. Nobody talks about it, but is it, it is a, seems to be, happens to be a statistical uh, fact. Now, here you can tell uh, fa uh, statistical facts that do not fit into the frame of the myth are sidelined. We don't pick them up, we don't even politicize them. So there's always a tendency to focus only on that which furthers your interest uh, in order to become a, a group. And here we go back to the um, Fukuyama um, discourse uh, that praised recognition for having uh, been misrecognized uh, um, uh, and, and so forth. So we are back to that kind of, um, um, uh, yeah, fight within the society that obstructs uh, every sense of, or interest for the whole. And in the sense of the uh, IFD movement in Germany, we can say this is really what is happening. They're not interested in the whole anymore. They don't have any, any regard for the country as a whole or the benefit or the welfare of the country, um, but they're just trying to uh, uh, build up their power and uh, basis. So that is, in a, in a way, a very unpatriotic uh, behavior, uh, which, which uh, comes, comes out and therefore is also very uh, yeah, disconcerting. Thank you. Um, okay, so may, maybe it's the last, no? no? Um, okay, two last questions. Uh, the first one is over there. No? Yeah. Thank you. If I may, I would like to know the first mention of your participation at the conference, the Rotary Society of Daniel Ukrainian, and 
I would like to know much. What have you learned at this conference about uh, about Russian memory of the siege of uh, Leningrad as a German? And uh, what is your maybe some lessons, perspectives? <coughs> Thank you very much for this uh, important question. Uh, we have definitely learned a lot. In coming here, of course, we have prepared ourselves, and it is not a new, <clears throat> uh, these are not new uh, informations for me, uh, the history of the, this city and uh, the blockade uh, of uh, Leningrad is, is a topic that is also intensely studied at my university in, in Constance, where um, I have a colleague for you, um, Andrea Zemkov's Züge, who is doing actually an um, oral uh, history approach to this project, and I already heard her report on this. So I'm, I'm not really out of this picture, but I'm a, a very unusual uh, case. Uh, if I go around and what I do and ask people about what do they know about the Leningrad rocket, they have no idea. And even though um, Daniel Grani was at the German Bundestag in 2004, to give the big uh, lecture on our Holocaust Memorial Day, which is the 27th of January. Um, that has not really changed the situation that much. And I think we have to really work in Germany much more uh, to bring this event closer to uh, the public. And I think one way of doing it uh, is to show people that it was totally justified that Grani spoke in the Bundestag on the Holocaust Memorial Day because one year before uh, Auschwitz was liberated, exactly one year before ended uh, the Leningrad uh, blockage. So uh, also uh, liberated by the Red Army. So it is really important for the Germans to keep uh, these two memory events together and not to, uh, in light of one, to eclipse all the other events. Uh, and it takes a process of learning and um, I think the possibilities are there, and, and we will certainly engage more in this uh, transnational memory, which we think is, is very important. Thank you. And the last question from the. Yeah. Question for Zanetsky. Uh, what Context. Louder. Context. The language shot in Pergamon High. We also see. Uh, so it has concept uh, of the debrief uh, the be um, political didactics. That is uh, more interesting for me what they mean when they talk about the didactics from under and the didactics from oben. Uh, Can you please more uh, yeah. about this uh, tell me and send uh, me uh, to other authors Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I will question uh, in English. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. I will, I will respond in English and also ask the question uh, again in English uh, quickly. Um, the question is concerning uh, the concept of the memory from above and the memory from below. Um, how do I conceptualize this and uh, where have I written uh, more about it? So um, the way I conceptualize it now is that I speak of a frame which is created by the state. I start with the political memory actually, and I said without this political memory of the state, it may take a long time to for a uh, bottom-up memory to make it into this frame. But of course, if every, I would argue, many, many counter-memory start with a civic um, uh, activity or enterprise, and they perhaps eventually become uh, adopted. This was definitely our experience because we started to subscribe to um, a Holocaust mem memorial uh, in Berlin long before it was uh, made. And uh, <laughs> the first thing we, we <clears throat> were part of a group of 10 people, perhaps, and started a little good group of friends in Berlin. And they um, recruited us. And um, then uh, Chancellor Kohl was told about this. And he said, I'm not convinced that the German population wants it. So you please first bring us 500,000 uh, autographs, Unterschriften, 
to show that there is a pressure from below that will do something like that. It was amazing. We have collected so many Unterschriften, <laughs> signatures, but uh, it was a uh, real, uh, in, in the pre-digital time where we have tasks to do. Um, uh, and then eventually other political pressures uh, started, uh, dynamics started to work that it eventually then got made. Um, but had the group not prepared something, had it not had a concept, had it not made a project, would never have entered into the political frame. Now, the political frame is not everything. The political frame provides uh, dates uh, of commemoration, uh, uh, monuments, especially on the state level. I'm not speaking of cities, they have uh, other liberties. Uh, then it provides school book texts. Um, I think these are really important uh, central list um, aspects. But then uh, it's the frame in which many, many other uh, actors are uh, moving and acting. And it is very important to keep them apart and to think about them as filling the frame, moving the frame forward, criticizing the frame, and also changing the frame. And here I'm thinking of uh, science, very important scholarship, and the arts, uh, that they can work within this frame, but also, of course, create their own you know, uh, ideas about it. And then the local uh, citizens um, <clears throat> who bottom up uh, do something in their cities. And here, what I think is so important, no city knows what the other city is doing. So cities are really enclaves in terms of social memory. They are really uh, rather rare self-contained. But it is so interesting um, what they do. And of course, the accumulation of similar interests you know, on a wider plane, that creates another kind of liveliness of that uh, uh, memory. And um, therefore, for me, it is a, a form of interaction. An interaction that keeps also the, the uh, political frame uh, Flexible. Um, thank you, everybody, for really interesting discussion and your questions. And certainly, thank you, Aleida, for your interesting lecture. And um, that's all. <laughs>